want to say thank you for having us, getting out to Minnesota. Uh, we're here, we're the first candidate to come out this cycle. Look at all the students. Big round of applause for all you guys coming out. So any, anybody in the audience that has a cell phone, just, just quickly, a smartphone, raise your hand real quick. All right, we're at like 100% on the college campuses. We have a campaign app. Uh, in the uh, App Store, Rand Paul 2016. Encourage you guys to download that. We want to bring the issues straight to you. We'll have uh, push notifications, some polls, so we see where the youth stand on the issues uh, and make sure that we're representing you uh, well. Uh, at this time, uh, I want to bring out somebody very special um, who, or excuse me, point out, uh, Allie Eichmann uh, is the College Republicans Minnesota State Chairman, uh, Chairwoman. Big round of applause for Allie. Where is she in the room? Allie, step in here, over here, guys. So Allie has uh, been an amazing uh, support for us, helping us set these programs up, willing to bring in many candidates, uh, but a big fan of Liberty, so really appreciate that. I'm gonna bring out now to introduce, we have uh, Richard Penny is the Minnesota State Chairman for Students for RAN. He has done amazing work here. Look at this crowd here today. Big round of applause for Richard Penny, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Richard J. Penny, and I serve as the state chairman for Minnesota Students for RAND. Senator Paul is one of the nation's leading advocates for liberty. First elected to the United States Senate in 2010, Dr. Paul has proven himself time and time again to be an outspoken champion of constitutional liberties and fiscal responsibility. As a fierce advocate against government overreach, Dr. Paul has fought tirelessly to return government to its limited constitutional scope. A devoted husband and father, Dr. Paul and his family live in Bowling Green, Kentucky, where Rand owned his own ophthalmology practice and performed eye surgery for 18 years. Rand Paul is a, is a dedicated physician and not a career politician, came to Washington to shake, to shake apart the establishment and to make a difference. During his free time, Dr. Paul performs eye surgeries for patients all across Kentucky and throughout the world. Dr. Paul's entrance into politics is indicative of his life's work. A desire to diagnose problems and provide practical solutions that work, whether it be in Bowling Green, Kentucky, or in Washington, DC. Now, everyone, let me ask you just a quick question. Who here is ready to hear from the next President of the United States? I stand for liberty. I stand against a justice system that imprisons nonviolent offenders in perpetuity. I stand against outdated drug laws that put kids behind bars, keep them from finding jobs, ruining lives, creating scars. I stand for privacy. I stand for a generation raised on technology. I stand against a government that invades personal privacy, spying on innocent civilians, it's indefinitely detaining American citizens in exchange for a false sense of security. I stand for peace. I stand for a less aggressive foreign policy. I stand against trillions of dollars pumped into wars that only create instability. I stand against thousands of lost lives. What have we got to show for our sacrifice? I stand for responsibility. I stand against too big to fail bank bailouts. I stand for a balanced budget and tax cuts. I stand against Federal Reserve handouts and 18 trillion in debt handed down to my generation. I stand for a strong and prosperous nation. I stand for political authenticity. A leader who believes in the power of individual liberty. A true visionary. I stand against the status quo. Old men in suits constantly towing the party line. I stand with the anti-establishment candidate. I stand. I stand. I stand. I stand with Rand. I stand with Rand. I stand with Rand. I stand with Rand. I stand as a student with Rand. I am a student for Rand. I am a student for Rand. I join students for Rand because this election is too important. I join students for Rand because the youth vote does matter. I join Students for Rand because it's time to endorse liberty and elect the President Paul. Join Students for Rand today at randpaul.com slash students. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Rand Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks for coming out. Now, the music you heard, that's my own personal music selection. So you know I've got good taste in music, right? I go to a lot of political barbecues. I'm all over the place. I'm at this political barbecue a couple weeks ago, and the guy in front of me loading up two plates of barbecue. And I said, well, you're not going to live very long eating like that. He said, well, my granddad lived to be 105. I said, I bet your granddad didn't live to be 105 eating like that. And he said, no. Nope. He lived to be 105 by minding his own business. <laughs> I kind of want a government that minds its own business. I want a government so small I can barely see it. I want a government that stays the hell out of my life. I don't want a government that's looking at all my phone records. I don't want a government that has the ability to collect them all and send them to some billion dollar underground facility in Utah. It makes absolutely no sense. But you know, we would have known nothing about this had Edward Snowden not broken the law to tell us. Our government, our government was lying to us. In fact, I think that's what ultimately prompted Snowden to do the release, is that the government was lying to us. James Clapper's the intelligence director. He was brought before the Senate, and he was asked point blank, are you collecting our bulk in, are you collecting any of our records in bulk? And he said, no. That's perjury. You should get a jail sentence for perjury. Why am I so harsh on this guy? Because we give extraordinary power. They have the power to collect all of your phone records. We're not talking about some of them, all of your phone records. And they say, well, we're not listening to them. We're not looking at what you're doing your phone. We're just collecting the records. Trust us. Well, how are we supposed to trust a guy who lied to us? That's the problem. This extraordinary power does require trust. It does require rules. And they're breaking the rules by telling us they're not even doing this. You know something they don't talk about much? They're also collecting a credit card number, your credit card information. They're collecting between 90 and 95% of all your credit card statements. If I have your credit card statement, I can tell whether you drink whether you smoke, whether you gamble, and how much. I can tell what you read, what books you order. I can tell who your doctors are. I can tell what your medications are from your credit card bill. The government, it's none of their damn business what you do in your private life. I stood on the floor of the Senate for 10 and a half hours berating my colleagues over this because the majority of them just don't care. I told them that the right most cherished among men and women is the right to be left alone. Justice Brandeis had it right. He said the right most cherished among civilized men and women is the right to be left alone. But one interesting thing is that Justice Brandeis said this in 1928 when he was in the dissent. The majority of the Supreme Court said, you do not have any expectation of privacy. Occasionally, the Supreme Court gets things wrong. They got it really, really wrong in 1928. It took 40 years till the Supreme Court reversed themselves and said, you do have an expectation of privacy in your conversation. But they still say that you don't have an expectation of privacy in your records. They say, once you make a phone call, the record's not yours. Same with the internet. They say once you've participated in the internet, the record is no longer yours. I disagree. You sign a privacy agreement. You've all seen the privacy agreements. The privacy agreement guarantees they're not supposed to divulge your information. You are supposed to be anonymized. But the government's not paying attention to this. The government seems to think, oh, well, we have to catch terrorists. Well, I kind of think it's the opposite. I think we're actually spending so much time collecting all of your records that we're not spending enough time actually individualizing our suspicion and looking for those who would attack us. So as much as I'm an advocate for privacy, if the government comes to me and says, this guy in Boston has been going back and forth to Chechnya, and the Russians say he may well be a terrorist, 
I'm fine with giving a warrant from a judge to look at his information, to look at his records. That's what the Fourth Amendment does. I tried to explain this to Christy, but he's, he's a tough, he's, a, he's, a, he's uh, the learning curve is very steep. That's, that's the nicest thing I can say. But the thing is, is that the police every day obey the Fourth Amendment or they will be fired. Almost every policeman in our country obeys the Fourth Amendment. If they are standing outside the, someone's house in Minneapolis and they think a rapist is inside, a terrible person, a murderer, a terrible person, someone who's beating up their wife, or they think a terrible person's in there, they stand on a corner and they don't go in. They call a judge on the phone and the judge gives permission, but almost always you get permission. But the Fourth Amendment says you have to individualize the suspicion. Tell me the person's name, tell me where they live, tell me what information you want, and what is the reason why you're suspicious of that person. Why do we have that? Why don't we let the police go in? Most police are good people, they are. Even though we hear about bad things, 98% of policemen are like the rest of us, are good people. But the thing is, is we have the checks and balances because we don't want bias to enter in. Because what if you get one policeman who says, I don't like black people, or I don't like brown people, or I don't like gay people, or I don't like Christian people, or I don't like Jewish people. You can get people who are bigoted for a lot of reasons. The policeman in the heat of the chase has to call. Not because we don't trust that policeman, but because the checks and balances are to protect all of us from something bad happening. We shouldn't let the government willy-nilly collect our records. We also shouldn't let the government decide that we're going to put people in jail for nonviolent drug crimes. Your friends should not be put in jail for marijuana. Now, I'm not here to advocate for marijuana. I'm here to advocate for freedom, all right? Each of the past three presidents admitted they may not have been perfect when they were in high school or college, and they may well have done something that was illegal. My point is, if they're all admitting this, and then we seem to acknowledge that the people going to jail are poor, primarily African American, primarily Hispanic, but all of them poor. And if you go to Andover, like a certain presidential candidate went, and says he smoked pot there, the police don't go to Andover, all right? The police go to the south side of Chicago. So when you look at marijuana arrests in Chicago, 15 to 1, black to white. And so we have to acknowledge that's what's happening. So if you're a rich kid who lives in the suburbs, and when you were a kid you smoked pot, I don't think you should be for rules that are putting all the poor kids in jail for this. Doesn't mean we have to say and celebrate something, but we should celebrate freedom. We should celebrate the state's rights to be involved with this. When the Constitution was written, there were four crimes. It's like treason, counterfeiting, piracy. That's all that the federal government did. The federal government did almost nothing with regards to crime. People say, well, we need federal murder laws. No, you don't. There have never been murder laws until recently. They were all state murder laws. Now, there are some quirky little things across state lines, but that's about it. The federal government's gotten over-involved. So not only are we putting people in jail for marijuana, do you know we put people in jail for milk? I'm, I'm not kidding. You can go to jail if you uh, milk the cow and sell it to someone across the state lines. You can go to jail. There was an Amish farmer who was arrested in Pennsylvania, handcuffed before sunlight, thrown to the ground for selling milk. There was an organic store in Los Angeles, same thing, raided by the USDA. Do you know the Department of Agriculture has a SWAT team? There are 48 federal agencies that have SWAT teams. The Department of Agriculture, the Department of Education, so make sure you pay your student loans. <laughs> The Department of Education actually did handcuff a guy for six hours. Turned out they were looking for his wife for student loans. I mean, we've gone a little crazy when we're doing this. I, have a, I know a gentleman, not personally, but I know his story, who was arrested for RICO Act violation. RICO is this conspiracy thing. It's supposed to get gangsters and drug dealers. He was arrested for putting clean dirt on his own land in southern uh, Mississippi. So he wanted to raise the elevation of his land, and they came to him and they said, oh no, your land was a wetlands. There was no water on the lands. Did have some elevation when there was a lot of rain, there might have been some water in the land, but it was his land and he was selling it for real estate. Put dirt on there without the government's position, uh, pro without their permission, 10 years in jail. He was 70 years old, he spent 10 years in jail. Another guy by the name of John Potsky was a Hungarian, uh, Hungarian uh, immigrant to our country 
fought against the communists over there, came here seeking freedom, same thing. This was in an industrial area uh, in Pennsylvania. He bought the land across from him, which is a junkyard. There were old rotten automobiles and jalopies. There were 7,000 tires, and when it rained, it flooded. So he bought it, and he decided he'd clean it up. He picked up all 7,000 tires, and guess what? When you clean up ditches, sometimes it doesn't flood anymore. But somebody had called it a wetland. He started putting dirt on it. He, had, he got three years in prison, $250,000 signed. He died bankrupt and bitter at the country that he came to, the great country of ours that's been the freest, you know, richest country in the world, and we're doing this kind of stuff. The reason I'm running for office is government's gotten too big. It's in your economic lives. It's in your personal lives. It has just run amok. And as a consequence, though, I think we're at the tipping point. And why should it matter to you? It should matter to you because you're going to be looking for a job pretty soon. You've got to understand how jobs are created. See, if you think that, well, oh, I, you know, Bernie's great. Oh, Bernie wants to give me free stuff. I won't have to pay for my college. There is no free lunch. Bernie can only pay for your college by taking it from somebody else. Socialism has the inherent implications of threat, threats and force. It has to. Because if they want to tell you you can't sell stuff, if I can't sell shoes or jeans or shirts or cell phones, if only those approved by the government can, how do they stop me if I want to? What if I continue to sell bottles of water and they say you're not the official state-owned seller of water? What will they do to me? They'll find me. What if I keep doing it? Imprison me? But what has been the effect of this many times historically when the state owns things? You talk about cronyism, the, the people who are favored get to sell things, and the people who are not don't. But ultimately, it's, it, is, it, is, it is wound up in the elimination of, of entire segments of the population. People say, oh, you're saying that Bernie Sanders is Pol Pot. No, I'm saying that he's embracing the same philosophy of socialism that led ultimately to the extermination of people. Stalin killed tens of millions of people. They say, well, Bernie's not going to do that. Probably not. Well, Bernie believes in democratic socialism. You know, it doesn't matter whether a majority takes your rights away or whether one single authoritarian <laughs> takes. So if a majoritarian, somebody gets 51%, does anybody think slavery is less bad if a majority votes for it? So what if a democracy says, we're going to have democratic slavery? No one would say that's right. There are certain rights that are yours that come to you from your creator, and no majority should take them away. That's what the Bill of Rights is about. We're not a democracy. So for those who think, oh, we're going to go around the world and we're going to fight to you know, make the world safe for democracy, we're not a democracy. Our founding fathers were appalled at the idea of a democracy. We're a constitutional republic where your rights are guaranteed and your rights pre-exist government. Government was instituted among men to protect your rights, not to create rights. So you don't have a right to a chair. You don't have a right to shoes. You don't have a right to pants. You don't have a right to health care. You don't have a right to water. You have a right to be free. And then you have a right to pursue happiness. But nobody guarantees you happiness. If anybody comes to you and says, I'm going to give you this, ask them where they're going to get it from. If they're going to give you free health care, who's going to give it to you? The physician, the nurse, the janitor at the hospital, somebody's got to provide it. So you've got to take it from somebody. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There is no free lunch. Nothing is free. And it also takes away from the argument. Is health care costs, I mean, uh, educational costs going through the roof? Yes. But why don't we try to examine why educational costs are going through the roof? Number one, the supply and demand are screwed up. The demand is already subsidized greatly by government, and the supply is controlled by government. So if you want health care costs to go down, you got to break up the monopoly. you got to allow more things to happen. For example, I'll bet you at your university here, if you take an online course, it costs about the same as being in the classroom. In a true marketplace, it would cost one one hundredth because they wouldn't need the classroom for you. The internet would bring the price almost to zero per pupil. But what's happening is we still have a guild that has gotten together and controlled it, and it goes up and up and up. And all these universities, some of them have billion-dollar endowment funds, and yet students are struggling. 
let's try to figure out how to break up the monopoly and let the prices plummet and not just say, oh, well, we can give it to you for free. If you make it free and you keep the supply the same, the price will continue to rise. And whoever the person is that's paying for free will continue to pay more. In the debates, as we look forward, there are people on both sides of the aisle who I think are about the same. And I said this recently, partly to shock people, but also just to make sure they're paying attention. <laughs> on foreign policy, there's no difference between Marco Rubio and Hillary Clinton. They're both neoconservatives. <laughs> Hillary Clinton and Marco Rubio supported the war in Libya. They supported arming the Islamic rebels in Syria. They supported the first Iraq war. And they now both support a no-fly zone. A no-fly zone over Iraq is probably one of the single most uh, ridiculous and naive ideas that I've heard in recent times. But Hillary Clinton supports it and half the Republicans do. But think about what it means. They want a no-fly zone in a space that someone's already flying in. Russia already flies in the space they want to call a no-fly zone. So what does a no-fly zone mean? It means they want war with Russia and that they're going to shoot down Russian planes. It is the single most naive idea I've heard, and yet the media is like, oh, well, they must be strong on national defense, and they must be foreign policy experts because they're advocating for this no-fly zone over there. Who invited Russia? Iraq. Anybody else besides me disappointed that we spent a trillion dollars to liberate them? We lost nearly 5,000 young Americans over there, and then who's Iraq's best buddy now? Iran. Who's their second best buddy? Russia. When Russia wanted to fly troops and arms into Syria, who gave them permission? Iraq. Who is now giving them permission to fly in their airspace? Iraq. We need to think these things through before we get involved in another war. We need to ask ourselves, was the first war a good idea? Was the first Iraq war a good idea? We toppled Saddam Hussein, they'd say how bad he was. Yes, sometimes there are variations of evil on both sides of a war. Hussein was a bad guy, but are we better off? Are we safer? Is the region more stable? Well, let's see. Iran is stronger. Iran now has troops in Iraq. Hussein used to be somewhat of a counterbalance to Hussein. Hussein was a counterbalance to Iran. I don't see any way in which we're safer. I think the whole region's more chaotic now. Same thing with Libya. Once again, you had a tyrant, sort of a secular tyrant, Gaddafi, who somewhat kept radical Islam down. We toppled Gaddafi, and who replaced him? Chaos. So we have chaos throughout Libya. Libya is now what they call a failed state. A third of Libya pledges allegiance to ISIS. And so everybody's all like, what are you going to do about ISIS? What are you going to do about ISIS? I'm like, maybe we should quit arming them. In Yemen, the country just below Saudi Arabia, they've been fighting for a long time. But the Iranians are supporting these people called the Houthi rebels. There's Al-Qaeda in there, and then there's Saudi Arabia supporting the ex-government. There's like three or four different factions. But there are people on my side, Republicans, who are hysterical that there's a war going on that we're not involved in. And they're like, my goodness, we have to get involved in there because Iran is involved in there. And it's like, which side are you going to pick, Iran or Al-Qaeda. It's like, oh, well, sometimes we have to side with Al-Qaeda. The ambassador to Syria said this. He said, the former ambassador to Syria, he said, I oppose sending arms to the Islamic rebels because I thought some of them were radical and weren't friendly to America. And he said, it is inevitable that some of the arms you give to the Syrian rebels will fight alongside Al-Qaeda and alongside the people who ultimately became ISIS. I said, really? I thought that's who attacked us on 9-11. I thought we didn't like Al-Qaeda. Oh, well, we're just going to side with them for a little bit because ISIS is a little bit worse than Al-Qaeda. Talk about the lesser of two evils. We're talking about the lesser of really, really, really evil on both sides. And it's crazy and it's ridiculous. And I said when this came up, we had a foreign relations committee. I said, the inevitability of this or the great irony is that we'll be back fighting against our own weapons within a year. Sure enough. Now they've got, do you know, ISIS has a billion dollars worth of U.S. Humvees. They also have a billion dollars of cash that they pay their soldiers with. Talk about insulting. Our money is paying for the ISIS soldiers who are chopping the heads off of Christians. 
That's our money. That's our weapons. They have our tanks. They have our anti-tank weapons. We gave anti-tank weapons to a group there and had them about five minutes and ISIS took them away. Talk about foolish, moronic, I can't think of a strong enough word. President Obama has sent 50 people to war. We just inserted 50 people. Who the hell goes to war with 50 people? We trained 60, all right? This is a really brilliant move. We trained 60 of them, cost us 250 million, four million per fighter. So about three months ago, we inserted four. Who the hell goes to war with four people? Do you know how long they lasted? 10 minutes. They were captured after 10 minutes, and I don't know, 10, 20 million dollars worth of equipment was captured too. What in the world are we doing in the middle of a war we don't understand where both sides are evil? We should defend American interests. We should defend our vital interests. And people say, what is that? What is a vital interest? It's a good question. It should be debated. That's why our founding fathers did not give the power to go to war to the president. They gave the power to initiate or declare war was given to Congress. So a couple years ago, President Obama comes to our small lunch. It's just the Republican Senate. So there's about 45 of us at lunch. And I raised my hand, and he wasn't real happy, but he, he <laughs> took my question. And I said, when you ran for office, you very explicitly said one thing that I agreed with. You said that no president should unilaterally go to war without the approval of Congress unless we're under imminent attack. But then you went to war in Libya and we weren't under imminent attack and he said no Benghazi was. And I'm like, really? You meant that if any foreign city was under attack, that you had the right to act unilaterally? No one understood that to be what you were saying. No one understands that. No one even really, to, to say that and to make that argument is absurd. That the president has the right to unilaterally go to war when any city is being attacked? No, it's when we would be under imminent attack. You know, if there's a bomb coming towards up or bombers coming towards the U.S., yes, the president can act. But you know what? Within 24 hours of the first action, if I were the president, I would come forward to the Congress, lay out the case and say, vote for war or no war. You don't go to war in an underwhelming fashion. You don't go to war with 50 people or four people. That's absurd. You either go to war or you don't go to war. And right now we're uncertain whether we should go to war, so we ought to debate it. We ought to debate whether the first Iraq war worked or whether another war in Iraq war is going to work for us or whether or not we should protect American interests. doesn't mean we do nothing. See, I fault Hillary Clinton for not defending Benghazi. But we do need to defend our embassies and our consulates. There is a certain amount that we have to do. We have some commerce. There are things we should defend. But we don't need to be involved in another land war over there. If we want to win as a party, my party wants to win, we've got to be a bigger party. So I've been saying as I travel across the country, we need to be for the entire Bill of Rights. Not just the First Amendment, although the First Amendment is incredibly important. Second Amendment, right to bear arms, I'm for it. If you don't believe me, come into my house unannounced. <laughs> the Fourth Amendment, though, is important too. If you believe in protecting the Second Amendment, that you have a right to bear arms, the government shouldn't be allowed to come in your house without a warrant, without your name on it. They should not indiscriminately be allowed to search your records. But we also ought to be the party that defends the Fifth and Sixth Amendment. The Fifth and Sixth Amendment, I call these the Justice Amendments. We were the party of emancipation. We were the party of civil rights. We were the party of individual rights. We should be the party of justice. Fifth Amendment says the government can't take your property without due process or just compensation. What's going on in our country is something bizarre and I think really, really awful. It's called civil asset forfeiture, where if you're riding down the street and the police pull you over, and government says to you, the police says, do you have any money? You say, I've got $1,000. I'm going to the dentist. They say, give it to me. And you say, why? And they say, well, you don't know. It's not drug money. And it's like, well, wouldn't you have to prove your case before you take it from me? No, you're guilty until found innocent. That's the way civil asset forfeiture works. And it just so happens, it turns out, if you look who gets affected by it, poor people, African Americans, Hispanics, more than others. Poor white people, too, but poor people in general because they don't have banks and they tend not to be as organized as other people and they end up, the money gets taken from them. It's crazy that we would let the government do this. I have a reform that says, you know what? 
You should never have anything taken from you unless you're first convicted. You should be presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. The Sixth Amendment says you have a right to a trial by a jury. And you think, well, who could possibly be opposed to a right to a trial by jury? Well, let me think. I was having this debate on the Senate floor, and I don't like to name names, but with a senator from Arizona. <laughs> and so we're having this debate, and they introduced legislation that said that an American citizen can be plucked up and put in jail, indefinitely detained forever. And I'm like, I was incredulous. And I said, do you mean an American citizen could be plucked up, sent to Guantanamo Bay with just an accusation, with no trial, no lawyer? And he said, yeah, if they're dangerous. I'm like, really? Kind of begs the question, doesn't it? Who gets to decide who's dangerous and who's not? We can't allow one person or some authority to do it. I mean, the right to a trial by jury, we've been fighting for stuff like this for a long time. One of the things that makes our country great is that when we had a revolution, we didn't give up on some stuff. We kept the tradition that probably began with the Magna Carta or before to try to restrain government, to try to limit government, have legal rules that told government it could only do certain things. But to pluck somebody up without a trial, and in that moment, I was thinking to myself of the times we've gotten it wrong. There have been times in our history when we did things we shouldn't have done. 100,000 Japanese Americans were incarcerated in World War II without any kind of trial, without a lawyer. During the civil rights era, we tapped the phones of civil rights leaders. We tapped the phones of people who dissented against the Vietnam War. All of it illegal. I was thinking all of those times. And then I was thinking, there was a guy named Richard Jewell, and he was thought to be the Olympic bomber about 15, 20 years ago. Everybody said he did it. They convicted him on TV within hours of the bombing. Everybody said he did it. Only problem was he didn't do it. But he fit the profile. He had glasses. And I see a few of you <laughs> in a backpack. I see a few people with backpacks. He fit the profile, and so everybody said he did it, but he was innocent. But I was thinking to myself, when McCain stands up and says, we don't need trials in this country. If someone's dangerous, we lock them up forever. I was thinking to myself, what if Richard Jewell, who was falsely accused, what if Richard Jewell had been a black man in the South in 1920? What might have happened to him? The reason we have the Bill of Rights, the reason you have the Sixth Amendment is the Bill of Rights is for the least among us. It isn't so much that the prom queen needs the Bill of Rights. It isn't so much that the high school quarterback needs the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is for the least among us, those who might not be popular. But we have to defend it. If we become the party that defends with passion, if we become the party that defends with vigor the Sixth Amendment, I want to be the party of justice again. I want to be the party that defends the Sixth Amendment with the same fervor we defend the Second Amendment. And I think if we defend all of the Bill of Rights, when we become the party of the Bill of Rights again, when we become the party that defends the Sixth Amendment with the same fervor as the Second Amendment, we're going to rock and roll to victory, and that's the party I want to be part of. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. You're going to announce pictures. Where are we going to do them? Right over here. If you want to hold here, I'll walk I'll over. All right, good. Guys, at this time, uh, we would like to invite anybody today that is going to pledge your support for Senator Paul. Uh, we will be inviting everybody to the back here for a photo line. Uh, the line will start right here on this side, and it's going to go from there all the way back. So if you guys want to line up, you guys are out of luck. You're going to have to slide over to this side. Uh, all supporters will get a photo. One more round of applause for our next President of the United States, Senator Rand Paul.